He's nervous. Either heard something or smelled something. It wasn't me. This is the helicopter. Token helicopter, right? Imagine if I had five bucks for every helicopter that made its way into one of these videos. Back inside again. Hmm. Made it home last night. That's a long trek, man. I'm sure the whole community is looking forward to that, that highway getting opened up. All the other smaller towns that depend on the tourist money, like uh, Euculet and Tofino, they're taking a beating. A beating. I could imagine all the little shops and pull-ins in Coombs, Coombs, BC, C-O-O-M-B-S. Little community as well that thrives off tourist money as people travel all the way through to come through here to go to Tofino and it's just stopped dead. It's unfortunate. But anyway, a um, couple things I'm going to share with you guys that I've thought about sharing for a long time I just haven't got around to it because I have this old chest <clears throat> which I don't know when it was made. A gazillion years old and uh, I have a whole it's just albums and albums of photographs in it from well before the digital age, right? It's kind of funny when you look at the pictures and see how young you are, it's like, oh my god. And meanwhile, in the photo, I can remember the voices, the smells, the scents, the views. I remember it all like it was absolutely minutes ago. I don't forget shit. And um, it's so weird to see the photograph of that moment and how long ago it was. <laughs> it's like, whoa, my god, you gotta be kidding me. But anyway, I'm gonna share a couple, a story of mine to start and I'll share some more voices and I'll, what I'll probably do is I'll take a picture of these photos and I'll post them up for you to see clearer clearly but this photo right here is of what we call in the north woods or any woods I'd imagine especially in British Columbia Alaska the Yukon Northwest Territories is called a cache cache and what a cache is, it is a platform that you build in the woods and you build it high enough to compensate for snow load in the wintertime. And what it is, it's a platform and you build it on top of existing trees that are growing out of the ground. And you build a platform, you'll take say three or four trees, you know, go around in the spruce, in the timber, to find the correct four trees growing in the correct place, meaning four corners. It's these four trees, 
you know, with maybe what, 8 inch, 10 inch bases, whatever, and you're going to hope to find four trees in a square. So it's like four legs, like in a table. Exactly like a table. And then you get out of your saddle on your horse, you'll either use your axe, and you always have a big bag of big nails in case you're out there to create a camp or a cache. And then you make yourself a ladder. So you're going to cut down two younger trees or poles, or find two poles, and you're going to make an appropriate pole ladder with all the rungs and your nails, and you, and you fast yourself a ladder. It goes up to about, usually around 16 feet. And then you limb up each four of those tree trunks with your little chainsaw or your axe. Usually we bring a chainsaw stuffed into the pack horses, a small one. <clears throat> and then you limb as high as you can from the ground, and then you get your homemade ladder you just made, and you lean that against each of the four trees, and you continue limbing all the way up to at least 16 or so feet high. And then you cut the top of each pole off with your chainsaw. So I'll put, you'll put the ladder up one tree, bam, chop it off at say 16 feet off the ground. And then you climb down, move your ladder to the next tree, go up, try to chop it off as low as you can. So now you have four tree trees, tree trunks, 16 feet off the ground. And then you take one of your remaining poles, your branch, well, not branch, but the pole of the trunk, and you cut it off so that it'll go span the top of one tree to the top of the other at a 90 degree angle and then you notch it out with your chainsaw or your axe and you nail it down into the top of those two trees and you do it again on the other ones and then you go get even more poles but now you cut these poles so that when you lay them on top of your two 90 degree poles you lay them on top from these two trees to those two trees that they are actually going to overhang by at least at least four feet on both sides. That's what we like. I like to do is four feet on both sides of those four tree trunks going up. So you follow me. So it's like you're building a table in the middle of nowhere. A table, four legs, and the tabletop. Only the tabletop overhangs the four legs by four feet all the way around it, so that nothing can get up those tree trunks and take all of your goods, your camp, that you're going to leave on top of that platform. You're going to cache them there for later. And so what we were doing with this one particular outfit I was guiding with, this, this is back in the late 1990s. And um, I was with two other guys, full on. These guys are redneck, northern hill, Bill E's. Cowboys. Hillbillies, whatever you want to call them. I can tell stories about these two characters some other time. But anyway... Um, we had to ride, so we're dropped off on the Alaska Highway in the middle of freaking nowhere. We're dropped off with around, I don't know what we had, probably had a dozen horses, including our saddle horses and pack boxes and gear. And we're loaded up, it's July, it's before hunting season started, and what the elephant wanted us to do was go and explore his guide territory and get deep, and as well on the way back, we are to stop at these previous made camps and take an inventory of what's there and what needs to be packed out there to complete or replace whatever gear might be broken and make it into a, a, a proper cached camp so that later on whoever goes to go guide in that area could take their hunter or hunters and with confidence only pack their personal sleeping items and the food and get dropped off and take a pack train of horses and pack all the way out there. Lean the ladder back into the cache because when you're done, obviously you throw your ladder on the ground or put it way away so nothing can use your ladder to get on top of that cache and ruin your camp goods. And then later on, if somebody's going to go out there and guide and take a hunter out there, you take your hunter, you take all your groceries and uh, all your personal camp gear and you head out there and then you uh, throw the ladder against the cache, get up there and you'll pull the 150, 100 pound, 150 pound canvas wall tent that is wrapped up, stowed on that couch. You'll take that tent down, your stove, your wood stove that's been already previously packed out there. Um, you're cooking, all there's, there's rubber made containers. There's two or three of those usually at a, a camp or one or whatever you have you, your rubber made, which inside of that will have say canned goods, cutlery, steel camp plates, you know, metal camp plates. Uh, the wood stove for the wall tent, the chimney, 
nails, hammer, a, gr a grill in case you want to cook on top of fire. Basically, uh, what you would need, all your, your camp basics, okay? And that's all stowed up there, even maybe some, 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 some uh, cape salt, salt for salting down the hides when you get your game. Um, some tools, camp stove, fuel, candles, anything, coffee mugs, whatever, it's all there. So, here we are, I'm with these two guys. Don't even know them that well. And we have been in the middle of nowhere for quite some time, and I am, at the same time, I'm realizing that these guys are absolutely crazy. But anyway, so that's for another time. So, right along, we're, we are about, I don't know, if we had to go one way non-stop, we have to stop. But we were around four or five days, maybe even more. We could have been more like a week into it. We were gone two weeks, but we were more, more into about a week into it. We're in the middle of frickin' nowhere, man. I mean, the middle of nowhere. Busting open these remote cabins that haven't been used in centuries. And uh, some, of them were, some of them were destroyed by grizzly bears. Actually, I'll share with you, one, one old cabin had a... Uh, I took a picture of what it looks like when a grizzly bear busts in. So, here's the photo here, and that's my sawed-off shotgun I've got leaning against the window. What, what you normally do in a camp like that, and what he did was, that sheet metal was nailed all around the window and then on the bottom on the on the outside the window on the ground is a full piece of plywood with three inch nails spiked up through the plywoods so that are sticking in the air to detour any bears from going and busting in the window. But obviously a grizzly bear managed to get in anyway. He didn't give a shit, made his way around, slammed that sheet metal in like it was probably a beer can and went in there and demolished the inside of that cabin. So there's, there's a, a picture there, but that's one of the camps that we busted into that had a cabin. And then we carried on, on horseback, and went up around this mountain, literally going, swimming the horses through canyon rock walls with water and swimming the horses through that water and me not even knowing if there's a waterfall coming, following these ding-dongs. It was quite the adventure. I should probably write a book about it. So now we get to this remote camp where this cache is previously built with a previous camp on top. As we're riding in, here's this bundled up wall tent around 100, whatever they are, 150 pounds, I think, 100 pounds. And here's a canvas wall tent bundled up still, and it's on the side of the river, on the rocks, not in the water. And it is about, it's probably about a hundred yards away from the cache where it was sitting on top of the cache. All right, about picking up what I'm putting down. I picture this. There's no roads, there's no trails, there's no human beings. There's three of us, a dozen horses, and we just rode. It took us three days to get back from that camp. Let's put, put, let me put it that way. It took us three days riding in one direction to get back to Alaska Highway heading south. That's how far in we were. And, it's, and that country is the lowlands. It's not up in the... We are low, way low. We are, we're rock bottom low. And as you travel west for a handful of miles, then you get into the foothills of the Rockies, and then the Rocky Mountain Peaks. So we're on the eastern... We're in the east side of the Rocky Mountains, but we're in the low flatlands. Big spruce forests, big trees, cottonwoods, spruce. Moose, <laughs> right? Grizzly bears, wolves, and uh, we're not up in any hills. We're on flat ground. And uh, we rode in there, and here's the here's the wall tent inside of the river. And then I took note. Wait a minute, what's going on, man? And then as you get as you ride in the trail, so there was a trail that goes in from the river right to this previously built primitive camp made by the previous owner of the outfit, the previous outfitter. And uh, we rode in there, going by map, how to get there hand scribbled map and we found it and here's the wall tent around a hundred yards away from that cache taken off of the top of that cache which has a four foot overhang I got the pictures right here to show you guys and the and the wall tent didn't even have a tooth mark in it there wasn't a tooth mark in it or a claw mark in it okay then there was also two different rubber rubber made, you know those, those rubber containers, the square ones with the snap-on lids, which keeps everything dry. There was two of those that were as well on top of that cache with the wall tent, <clears throat> with all the camp goods inside. 
and they were taken off the top of that cache. But actually, everything was taken off of the top of that cache, and it was strewn about on the ground below, everywhere. Everything was open, everything was strewn about, and I mean everything. Coffee, cans, coffee, emptied out. Canned goods, if they were there, they're gone, I'm guessing. I didn't know I didn't make the camp. I don't know what was there previous. The Rubbermaids were on the ground, one standing up, you can see it in the photo. Rubbermaids standing up. Every single thing was taken off of the top of that platform and strewn about the camp and the 100, 150 pound wall tent was down river without a bite mark on it. <laughs> right? So I'm just, everybody's quiet. <clears throat> and uh, we're kind of walking around, we're tying up all of our horses. I'm kind of looking around, I'm looking up at this cache. I'm looking at these guys. They're not saying shit, they're just well, doing the usual big, big wad of frickin' chew. Looking around, mumbling, whatever the mumbling, I'm like, so finally I broke the silence first, and I go, So, what do you think did this? Right, and kind of looking at me, I don't know. <laughs> right, and I go, well, come on, seriously, what do you guys think did this? Right? And one of them went, well, because it's probably down Wolverine. And I go, I'm like, what? I go, Wolverine. So what you're telling me is the uh, Wolverine sheeting up the poles, and there was sheet metal wrapped around the bottom of those poles, too. There was sheet metal. So what you do is you wrap around old sheet metal, light sheet metal, so that bears can't even dig their claws into those poles. They just they slide off it. And uh, I go, Wolverine. So what you're telling me is the uh, Wolverine sheeting up the pole, and he stuck his toenails into the bottom of the platform, and he went like this for four feet to the outside edge, and he climbed on top of the platform, and he tossed the 150-pound canvas wall tent 100 meters to the side of the river. Is that what you're saying? What are you guys trying to tell me? And they didn't even want to talk about it. They didn't want to acknowledge the weird... They did not want to acknowledge anything. And I'm like, I don't give a shit. I already, by then, I've been with these two freaks for... A handful of days, and I realized that engaging them in any kind of intelligent conversation was not going to happen anyway. But I took my pictures, and that's that. And here's the photos. Here's the photos I took. Interesting, right? And then, uh, what camera would this have been? This is the old time, you know, the cameras, you'd have to go, uh, you'd have a few rolls of Kodak film with you for the full season. Excuse me, and then you would have to, uh, once you get home, we drop off. You drop off your Kodak rolls of film at the drugstore for uh, developing, and then you go and pick them up a handful of days later and see what you got, and hope the pictures came through. But those are the photos that I took, and this one photo of the cache. It looks like the tree the man is standing beside. It looks like it's beside the cache, and you could jump over easily, but you can't. That existing tree between myself, the camera, and the platform is probably a good eight. 10 feet away from the actual cache. There you go. I want to share that with you guys for a while now. And digging in my old, uh, digging in my old photos, I found the photos. So there you go. Share. And then uh, these other two photos that were there as well I, is actually a photo of me um, building a new cache in another camp location. So I thought I'd share those with you guys too. And that's I just I, I decided I was gonna to try to make a three a three treed cache that time instead of four. I just couldn't find the four right trees. So what took that wall tent off of that platform and all the other goods? <laughs> right? What did that? And anyway, we're gonna hear some voices besides my annoying voice and uh, with my broken glasses, but they're still gonna work. Check that shit out. So, who do we got? Where should I go? Should I go with some recent? I think I will. Alright, let's do it. This looks like a fairly long one. Let's get into it. Who needs to be heard? Whoever this is, you came to the right place. Dear Steve, thank you and your channel for giving me much needed solace as well as knowledge and data points. You would be interested in what happened to me a year ago and twice more very recently near the Humboldt slash Mendocino County headwaters of the Matoli River after an encounter with the inexplicable. I've become absolutely convinced that some unknown animal exists here. And I began on the internet a search of a similar account. 
Well, immersed, well, immersed suddenly in this mystery, it became clear to me that these experiences must be documented and conveyed to others. Last July 2018, I was staying in a very isolated region, which had very limited access behind three log gates, 20 miles south of White Thorn, California, on a primitive 4x4 road. This place is literally at the end of the road, a lost world of primeval forest on the northern border of a vast green belt spreading from Shelter Cove on the Lost Coast east to Highway 101 and south to Fort Bragg, as can be seen on Google Earth. About 3 a.m. I was awake. It was a hot, dark, and completely silent July night in these mountains. Something above my tent location, approximately two to three hundred meters, began knocking on wood. Best described as loud wax on a tree trunk by a big clubber branch. It started with one knock, which got my attention with a brief hesitation, then several more knocks, but randomly timed, some in succession, others after hesitation. The knocking was loud, so loud that it echoed down the canyon in the stillness. The event lasted only a minute or two. My first thoughts were that there was no one on the mountain who could be out here in the middle of a primitive and protected area. These knocks were, for, were from something large, and no North American animal could have made them. Listening intently while my mind tried to wrap around how the noise was made, I began to wonder about Bigfoot legends. The night fell silent again. Sorry. The night fell silent again. Afterward, I told a few locals and, earned, and learned that there had been many Bigfoot sightings near Piercy and north to Willow Creek. Flash forward to two weeks ago when, waiting at the first locked gate to the same conservation area, I heard two distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained. As I waited in the dusk for about 45 minutes, waiting to meet a party at the gate who were running late, I heard a very loud wail slash scream slash call that I've never heard before in nature. The call of this thing I located at about my 2 o'clock facing east and up the heavily wooded area above me about 2 to 300 meters. I instantly knew where I had, where I had heard such an unfamiliar call. About three years ago, when watching a Bigfoot reality show, where these hunt, where these Sasquatch hunters were making this strange slash unique call. At that time, I remember thinking about how ridiculous it seemed for people to be on television trekking at night, making strange calls in the woods. There was a few second delay from the first call, then a few more, then silence for about a minute, leading me to wonder if this whole experience was surreal pondering what I know about the wilderness, either that was an unknown animal or some kind of implausible prank. It was loud, echoing down the mountain, as though some huge creature could belt with the lungs of Pavarotti, only much louder. The chance of it being a prankster waiting in silence with me for 45 minutes in that remote, remote location, just to hang out in these impenetrable woods and prank me was highly unlikely. Having only a moment to ponder this oddity, there began another call out. At about three to four hundred meters to the north of the first, approximately my eight o'clock. It was also just as loud, but came only three calls in succession. Ooh-ah-oh, 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 with a distinct higher pitch on the ah. This absolutely blew my mind because the first call might be attributed to an elk on steroids, but the response, from what was clearly not an owl, brought chills down my spine. I quickly moved closer to my vehicle and listened for another 30 minutes in the darkness. I'll never forget this second vocalization, as it was so unique. And this was obviously communication between two individuals, as well as, possibly, a rudimentary language. I had a fourth experience, which I must mention here in context, but it happened just the night before the dual vocalizations. On Friday evening, November 1st, 2019, I just moved into a cabin that my brother and I rented, located along an extremely rugged canyon area of the Matoli River, M-A-T-O-L-E River. It was dusk, 
quite dark already in the forest. I was outside looking at the stars, taken in the newness of these rugged surroundings. Up above, again, about 300 meters up and to the east of the river, there was a screaming that was so loud and so foreboding that I could only listen in amazement. It was the loudest screaming I've ever heard. So loud, I thought it was produced by some kind of banshees from a horror film. The screaming continued, full throttle, for over five minutes. I know mountain lions can scream, but nothing like this. It sounded much louder, more, much, it sounded much louder, more guttural, literally as if someone had set up loudspeakers and played the bloodiest scream that Hollywood could, could produce. At the time, the night after Halloween, I wondered if someone was up on the mountainside pranking me as a newcomer of the neighborhood. I listened for a bit, then went inside and told my brother about it because it was so unnerving. Bigfoot did not ever enter my mind. But then at dusk, the very next evening, I witnessed these two calls waiting at the gate. I've since been over and over in my mind, why have I been so lucky as to hear or experience such mystery? Much less three distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained in a 24-hour period. I began poring over USGS maps and satellite, Im satellite imagery to ascertain what the link may be, some 15 miles apart. Were there any people or neighbors or access for individuals in the areas I experienced which may explain these? I've since hiked all of these areas searching for any activity but found only empty, dense woods. Could one creature in such obvious stress on one night have triggered the co coincidental travel of at least two more unknown creatures the very next night? I've talked to too many locals about hearing strange noises, but no one claims anything or they don't want to be ridiculed. I'd like to know if there have been recent experiences by others in my area. I'm a 60-year-old man with a high degree of credibility, extensive wilderness experience in forests and jungles, have trekked and lived in remote areas in Africa, Australia, Central and South America, in many places of potential danger, and never had an inkling of fear. I was born and raised near Yellowstone Park and never had, a bad, never had bad experiences with grizzly, mountain lions, or wolves. Traveling all these years with a firm understanding of ecosystems, I never could have believed in such mysteries that anything new would ever be discovered. What has happened to me recently has completely changed me on many levels. There is a mystery in these woods and I have a few ideas how to find answers to it. If anyone else has had similar experiences who live near me, I'm eager to share and explore this phenomenon further. Troy Hunter. There is very limited cell service. Okay, Troy, you get, give your email. I don't know if you wanted me to share this email with your request to find out if anyone else has had similar experiences who live near me. I'm guessing you did. Obviously you did. Yes, you did. Because I have your email at the beginning when you originally emailed and you left your email included. You typed it separate from what I received with your email. So bear with me, you guys. I'm just trying to justify sharing his email publicly, all right? And I think it's more than likely a green light, right? He was typed into the bottom. He had a question and everybody's around him. So here's his email. T-R-O-Y dot H-N-T-R at gmail.com. There you go. And good luck. And I hope that um, I'll guarantee you somebody near has had experiences they got knowledge. Guaranteed. And whatever you have in mind, I hope you share it with us down the road after you've done it. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're going to go out and look, look into it. If you've got more knowledge to share or you come across no more knowledge on your journey, please share it with all the people here. Okay, man? I appreciate that. And there's another person that just goes to show that it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how many years you've been doing anything in any remote continent. It doesn't matter. Just because you've gone your entire lifetime exploring all these places that this man has and haven't seen anything, it doesn't mean shit. There's no guesstimating if or when you are going to be slapped in the frickin' face with this truth, this reality. 
how many times we had people. Man, I hunted my ranch, we've been living in here for three generations, never seen anything, never heard anything. Set everybody. And then boom, in your face, right? In your face. There you go. Let's hear somebody else. Uh, actually, hold on a second. I got a quick question. Now, this is curious for me. Um, I know there is a bunch of spelunking caves. Spelunking cave diving caves in, in the state of Oregon. And I remember years ago, my uncle, who worked for the Canadian version of the FBI in the States, uh, we were talking about this topic years ago, and I remember him telling, because, let me back up a little bit. There's an area, there's a river called Gordon River. It's on Vancouver Island, west coast. It's a little farther south than we are fishing. And Gordon River dumps into the ocean beside the San Juan River in Port Renfrew. And Port Renfrew is in the San Juan River is the valley that travels up towards Shawnee and Lake, British Columbia. And it's also the headwaters of the San Juan River that dumps into Port Renfrew is where my grandfather had his face-to-face and as well where numerous other people have had encounters. What I'm saying is, my uncle told me that there's actually more caves, even more than the world famous caves in Oregon in the Gordon River area alone. He said that that area is absolutely riddled with caves, Gordon River area. That is north of Port Renfrew. So my question is, that area just mentioned, Willow Creek, um, my question is, is there, a is there, coincidentally, a lot of caves, cave systems around that area? That's my question for the previous emailer about that area. Is there an extent, is there, coincidentally, an extensive cave system known around the Willow Creek area? That's my question. Ma'am, moving along. Listen to this. This is titled, Urgent, Very, Very Urgent. All right, got our attention. This is a recent email coming in. Hello, Steve, you're doing great work and reach out to a lot of people and the entire world needs to hear this. I'm attaching a link to a video. Here's the link, no name. The United States is voting in two weeks to hand over sovereignty to the WHO, World Health Org, which is run by, I don't even know if I should read these, these words out. I'm going to get a gong here, which is run by C-H-I-N-A, who has 26 million people on lockdown in their country. This is going to hand control over to C-H-I-N-A of every country belonging to the United Nations. It's time to load those G-U-N-S's, brother, and have a bunch of people willing to fight down here in, uh, sorry, we have a bunch of people willing to fight down here in Nevada, and it's time. If anyone can reach out to help organize some people together, it's you. If this passes in, I think it's only one week. Now they get their one world GOV. And we're all going to be speaking C-H-I-N-E-S-E. -E. <laughs> my name is Alan Meeland. You can use my name. I don't care what people think and they can have themselves if they don't believe. Anyway, here's my Sabe story. Okay, here we go. I was up in Doris, California, D-O-R-R-I-S, California. I took a friend up on the mountain to check on her property she had up there, literally on the Oregon-California border. She had been in a car accident and hadn't been there in over two years and was still fairly screwed up physically and was a little slow mentally, but still with it for the most part. We checked her cabin and it had been ransacked by kids partying and her stuff stolen which was very depressing for her, but she wanted to take me to a spot where she wanted to build a new cabin, so I said, let's go. Because the thought of that, because the thought of that put a smile on her face again. So we drove past the cabin about a half a mile till the road ended. She took me up a trail going up the mountain that weaved back and forth through the piles of deadfall. This trail worked its way up the side of the mountain, and we had a pretty good cliff on the right which I noticed if you were to take the wrong way through the deadfalls, which were 10 feet or more high, you could walk right off the cliff. About a mile up, it opened up into a beautiful scene, a magnificent mountaintop view of Oregon with a gently sloping forest of lodgepole pine that would make a beautiful place to live. 
We looked around for a few until I heard what sounded like Babe Ruth hitting a baseball out of the park crack. I've always believed in Sabe, but never knew about the tree knocking. It was then that I noticed the sun was going down fast, and we had to get through that trail of dead ball. But at the moment, I was too worried I had my good flashlight on me, and I'd pulled it off the charger before we left, and we chalked the tree knock as one of her neighbors. We started walking back, and I pulled out my flashlight, and it wouldn't turn on, shaking it, smacking it, and not even a blink out of it. Then we heard another crack. And this one was just on the other side of the deadfall next to us. And that's when the feeling of ultimate doom hit me. And her. At the same time. There was no moon. It was pitch black. And one mile of treacherous switchbacks to go through these those deadfalls. Luckily she had a little flashlight on her keys. But it was almost dead. And it was like having a candle. We heard something huge walking on the other side of the deadfall getting closer. She whimpered a little and said I'm scared. I kept it to myself that I was absolutely terrified. I kept my composure and told her to grab my belt in the back and to hold on to it as hard as she can and step where I step and warned her that I was going to be hauling ass. All I could think about was my guns in the truck and why my fool ass didn't bring my 45. At least it would have added a little comfort. I started moving by candlelight through the windy, windy ass trail with those footsteps mimicking ours just 15 feet away. Oh my god, that's frickin' close. One time I thought we were done. I took a wrong turn at a Y in the road ahead of us and ended up at a dead end. It had to go straight back towards the footsteps and then saw it was a Y that way too, and the footsteps that followed us were on the trail to my left. My adrenaline kicked in. I told my friend to hang on tight and ran right and kept running the rest of the way through the, that maze and thankfully remembered all the right turns. She was terrified that we, that we made a wrong turn, but soon saw the best sight ever, the reflection of my truck's bumper. We jumped in and left full speed, digging trenches and probably giving the saw bay, which is no more than 10 feet behind us, as we could hear his breathing by the time we got to the truck. A good dirt path from the rooster trails of dirt I was throwing his direction. Every hair on my body stands at attention when I think about that night, and did, while I wrote this. And on a side note, my fancy rechargeable flashlight that acted like it was dead came on in the truck when we sped away. Electrical interference from the Sabe, I think. What about you? Anyways, share this all, especially that video. Sorry. Anyways, share this all, especially the video, and I'm with you, brother. The shit is hitting the fan, and we need to, we need to, we need organization. And we need it now. Bless you, Sarah. Keep up the good work. Sincerely, Alan Meeland. Okay, Alan. Appreciate you. I don't envy that experience at all. It's a shitty, shitty experience to be, have such massive terror. It's actually, it's just kind of rude, right? It's a rude thing to do to anybody, especially somebody innocent. You know what I mean? Like, come on. You've got the whole forest, the whole mountain, the whole valley, the whole outback. Why do you gotta do that to such innocent good people? Why? I don't get it. You know? You want to terrorize somebody, go to D.C., go to Ottawa in Canada and terrorize the living shit out of who deserves it. Why the little guy? Why does the little guy keep getting picked on? I don't get it. I don't get it. you got to wonder, you know, it, it seems to be somewhat substantial fact that they can tell our demeanor, they can tell our character, they can tell our intentions. And I wonder if, because I, I don't think we have truly, I don't believe we have truly evil people emailing us here. Here. I don't believe we have or do. And I wonder if possibly, if you are one of those true, dark, evil sons of bitches, where there is some on the planet, 
and you are in the middle of nowhere, I wonder what happens to the evil, true, dark people. I wonder, if anything at all, or if they can tell. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's an honest, it's an honest question. Let's just say you had some kind of a child predator, lifelong, evil, dirty, filthy, bastard, person, trafficking, child predator, demon, in a human form, in the forest, in the middle of nowhere, and they come across these beings. What's that interaction like? Are they getting treated any differently? Are they getting stomped on the ground, disappeared? I don't know. But it's not a question, it's not a thing to wonder about, right? I wonder. But I don't understand it. I don't know why. I don't know why they do this to people. But I guess as long as you made it home safe and sound, it's actually no harm done, right? I mean, it's their awkward way of communicating. Don't know. Um, but a little side note to you personally. If, if it is what you're planning and what a lot of people have... Let's put it this way. It doesn't matter what country you are or where you are. Today, with the internet and information, and let's just say there was an enemy online looking for their enemy, or who's a potential enemy, or who may be potentially organizing to do something. You don't want to put your name and your intentions online. First off. Okay, man? Because if it is, if that is what's going down, you just jeopardized it. And everybody involved. By, by speaking publicly like that. Alright? So. Take care. And govern yourself accordingly, no matter what you do. <laughs> right. Now, uh, moving back to these original topics. Let's hear somebody else. I appreciate you sending that in, man. I'm glad you guys made it safe. Before you start, let me give you my background. Alright. I'm 50 years old. I have two kids, two grandkids. I've been married for over 29 years. And I've been a, been a Toronto police officer for over 28 years. I started shooting when I was 7 years old. I started hunting woodchucks and rabbits when I was 9 or 10 years old. I did a lot of fishing, canoeing, boating, camping, and hiking when I was a kid. I started hunting deer and bear when I was about 14 or 15. And have every year since. And started hunting moose about 14 years ago. My parents were Salvation Army officers and were transferred all over Canada. I've done all of the above all over Canada during my younger years and continue now in Ontario where I permanently reside in Ajax, which is just 10 minutes east of Toronto. For the last 10 years I've hunted moose about 30 miles northeast of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, near a small town called Search Mont near Northland Lake. Over the years I've seen all kinds of wildlife. I've never laid eyes on what I saw last week while hunting moose. I thought I was losing my marbles, and I thought, and that thought was reinforced when I told my brother-in-law, bracket my hunting partner, and bracket the story. <clears throat> Excuse me. I later told my wife over the phone my story, and she was intrigued by my story. She apparently told a co-worker who found your site on the internet. <clears throat> when I called her to tell her I was on the way home, she told me of your site and that there were several sightings in Ontario. And that's when I realized that maybe... I wasn't just seeing things or losing my head. When I got home, I checked out your site and figured you're the only people I can tell my story to that won't think I'm completely nuts. Anyhow, to my story. Sorry, it's a little long, but it doesn't make sense if I don't tell it all. <clears throat> Excuse me. My brother-in-law and I were hunting moose just northeast of Sault Ste. Marie. S-A-U-L-T-S-T-E Marie. On Tuesday, 14th of October, 2003. I went up an old trail to where it came to a dead end. I got stuck on my ATV in the mud, but managed to get out and turn around. I went part way back down the trail to where I found a clearing, and parked on the west side where I could see about 200 yards north and south. I stopped there at about 7:45 a.m. I put out some moose cow. I put out some moose cow in heat urine scent on the surrounding trees, and a few minutes later did a moose cow call on my horn. I looked at my watch which said it was 8.05 a.m. At about 8.15 a.m. it started to rain. I didn't want to get my gun wet, so I put it back in the gun boot on my ATV. The rain helps hide my scent, but at that time, makes it noisy in the bush with the water hitting the ground, leaves, trees, etc. At 8.30 a.m. I start hearing footsteps 
and snapping twigs coming from the northeast of my position. The rain noise disguised this noise until it was very close to me, and because of this, I wasn't ready. Gun still in boot. And all of a sudden, I heard the distinctive sound of a bull moose raking his rack on the brush very close. I looked to my left, and I saw a huge bull raking his rack about 70 yards from me. I reached back and pulled my gun from the boot and dropped the boot cover on top of my ATV, which made a banging noise. When I turned back to where the moose was, it took off back into the dense brush. I thought this is a bit strange because I've seen several moose in the past that just stood there. They don't seem to be afraid of anything. They just stand there. I've had them stand in front of me for several minutes before walking up into the bush in the past and couldn't understand why this one took off so fast. I stayed still for an hour, hoping he would come back. During that time, I called on my horn and I heard him rack, rake his rack on the bush twice and grunt at me as he headed off in a southerly direction through the bush. Through the bush. Turns out there was a gully just out of my line of sight that he used to walk around me and disappear. I was later able to raise my brother-in-law on the radio, who showed up and went to where I'd seen the moose. He checked the bush and found fresh tracks, which showed the moose had gone around me in this gully, which is just out of my line of vision. He suggested that I sit near where the moose had come out and see if he might come back. I then crossed the clearing and sat on my ATV about five yards from where I saw the moose and sat facing east. Again, I sprayed some moose cow and heat urine scent on the trees around me, and I did a few calls on my horn. By this time, it was around 12.30 p.m. I had noticed, uh, sorry, I had decided that I would sit there for the rest of the day hoping to see the bull come back. While there, I ate my lunch, got off the ATV a few times to stretch my legs, had a few cigarettes, and even had a little snooze. During this time, my back was to the gully that the bull had used to walk around me. At about 1.30 p.m., I started hearing heavy thumps behind me every now and then. Every time I heard one, I would turn around, but there was nothing there. I should mention that it was still raining. The sound of the rain hitting the ground or the leaves was quite loud, but these thumps were much louder. They sounded like a stone or something hitting heavy ground, but every time I turned around, I saw nothing. At about 5.25 p.m., I got off the ATV to stretch my legs and have a smoke, put my gun in the front bag of the ATV to make sure I had it within reach, and stood in front of the ATV facing the gully, which is to my rear prior to this. While I was having a smoke, I started hearing the distinctive sounds of footsteps coming from the gully, snapping branches and leaves crunching. I kept my eyes on the gully while I, while I reached for my rifle. I thought the bull was coming back. When I looked into the gully about 40 yards straight in front of me, I saw what I thought was a man walking towards me. He was stooped over and looked like he was having trouble walking in the bush. He grabbed a tree and swung himself around and ducked or dove down behind some thick brush. The total time of this took three to five seconds and he disappeared. He looked to me as if he was dressed all in black, with a black toque or a balaclava on his head. The reason I thought he was wearing a toque was his head seemed to have to be long at the back like a man wearing a toque. It looked like it was wearing a jacket, and the front of his jacket was open halfway, and I could see a different color of lining showing around the neck area. It looked like it was light gray or almost blue in the chest area, in the shape of a V. I couldn't really see how tall it was because his legs were behind thick brush and I could only see about mid-thigh. But I would have guessed at the time that he was anywhere from 5'8 to 6 foot tall. But he was about 40 yards away and it's hard to judge height or size in the bush when you're not sure of the distance. His arms seemed too long for a man but he was extremely muscular like a bodybuilder with a typical V-shaped build. There is definitely no fat on him at all. I can see the different muscle groups of his upper body, on his upper body and arms bulging out and, can, and could see that it had a washboard stomach. When he grabbed the tree, 
I saw that he had hands, not paws. He swung around the tree and dove for cover, as if trying to hide from me. As I said earlier, it was a dull day and was raining and he looked wet. He was covered with black or dark brown hair and it looked like the hair was stuck to him fairly closely because he was wet. What also gave me the bodybuilder impression was that he seemed to have no neck or he had so much muscle on his shoulders that it gave that appearance. On top of all this, his shoulders were extremely broad. There was a line of dense brush leading off to my left from where it dove into, which carried on for about 30 to 40 yards. About 10 to 15 seconds after it went behind this bush, this brush, I heard a hoarse, a hoarse, raspy cough, followed by a long, hoarse, sad-sounding howl. It sounded like a wolf howl, but much deeper than any wolf I've ever heard. The sound came from about 20 yards from where I first saw it dive for cover. When I first saw it, I thought it was a man, maybe lost in the bush, but my first thought was, why isn't he wearing any orange? And, if he's lost, why didn't he just ask for help? But the howl made me realize quickly that this was no man. The next thing going through my head was, what the hell was that? That was no moose. It was definitely not a wolf or a bear. It was like nothing I've ever seen in 35 years of hunting. What it looked like to me was a gorilla, or very close to one, but it walked upright, not on all fours. I stood there motionless for almost an hour and a half waiting to see if it would show itself again. During that time I remembered a show I saw on the Discovery Channel about a month before this trip about a man and his son that were hunting in British Columbia where they saw a large animal throwing rocks at them. They took off and reported to whoever, but they later figured out it might be a Bigfoot warning them to get out of, these, uh, out of his area. I then thought about the loud, heavy thumping noises behind me and realized that maybe this creature was throwing something at me. After a while, it started to dawn on me that I may have just seen a Bigfoot, and I started to get just a little scared. I normally leave the bush after dark when hunting, but this night, I left about an hour, sorry, but this night, I left about a half hour prior to make sure I had lots of time. I was going to go back to that area the next day looking for that bull, but I couldn't bring myself to go anywhere near that spot. And that's the first time in 35 years I've ever been afraid in the bush. Since then, I've wondered if this thing I saw was what scared the bull away. Like I said earlier, I've seen many moose in the bush, and I've never seen one run from me like that. Interestingly, though, from where the bull ran off to where I saw this creature was only about 50 yards. Another thing. I don't know if this means anything or not. Where I was sitting, I saw a large, probably moose leg bone laying on the ground about five feet from my ATV, and it wasn't cut or sawed. It had been broken or snapped. It looked to be about at least a year old. Number two. When I was 18, I was driving my girlfriend, at that time, home. It was early fall, just getting dark. She lived on a dirt road, right in the mountains by Lake Superior. I just passed the dump, which is right on Highway 17, and something big leaped across the entire highway in two to three steps. It was dark brown, almost black, and was like a blur, so we didn't get a good look at the body shape. My girlfriend said to me, Sorry, my girlfriend just said, get me home now. Because we didn't have a clue what it was. All we seen was a dark blur take three steps and it was in the bushes. So, the 97 Camaro moved a little quicker after seeing that. Number three. In November 2017, I was on the back balcony of my house. I could hear an electrical current from above, but nothing was above me. It was a fairly clear night and there wasn't anything flying around in the sky except a couple of clouds were way up high. So I kept looking around for a few minutes and then suddenly I'd seen something I can only describe as a veil. It looked almost like a grid crossing horizontally but also corresponding with a grid crossing vertically. So I took some pictures of it and I don't really do justice for what I actually saw. The pictures were taken perfectly still, but they captured a light moving through them, 
as if it or I was moving. I didn't see I didn't see a light in real time, and like I said, I wasn't moving when I took them. Very strange. Like you say, you can take from it what you will or leave it. They are what they are. Number four. <clears throat> this January I was on my way home from night shift in the early morning around 4.30 a.m. I seen a large, very dark figure on the side of the road standing as still as possible. Me being tired never thought much about it until the next day. When I went back to town in the morning to grab groceries and on the way back I noticed footprints going up the steep snow bank and then up a rock face. The prints were right where I'd seen the dark figure. I then continued 100 to 200 meters up the road and on the side of the highway in the bush. Okay, let me read that again. Sorry. I then continued 100 meters to 200 meters up the road and on the side of the highway in the bush there was actually a structure. And this spot is very interesting. Little blackbirds hang out here in bunches during the winter, but nowhere else on this stretch of highway. Also, it is a dead zone for FM radio and cell phones. I don't believe in coincidences anymore. So I wanted to share this info to add some pieces to the puzzle. We are all left in the dark with lies. And it's time to shine some light on the truth. I have some more pieces to the puzzle, but I have, but have a long enough email here, so I'll save those for another time. Thank you again, Steve. You have no idea how much this means to Kayla and I. Once Kayla has recovered, we hope to make it out in the future for a fish. We've never been to BC, and I've been itching to go. Keep grinding, Jamie. Okay, Jamie, appreciate you, man. And uh, just for everybody out there, again. Um, you can almost tell um, now, by now, it's almost every time we get a, someone who's in law emails us, you're very detailed. I've noticed that with all law enforcement officers. When you relay the story, you, are, you share every single detail. It's a good thing. To some, it may seem it goes on, but it's a very good thing. You put us right there and you show us every single thing you saw, the, 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 the conditions, everything. But you saw the tracks in the snow. Did you take pictures? Did you go check them out? You know, it's funny how many people see something standing there in the snow and they never go take a, they never go take, take a photo of the footprints in the snow. Not every time, right? A lot of times people just don't do it. I don't get it. I don't know why. Like that one, uh, there's that video that came up past couple years of that red hair covered being that got up on the edge of the timber on the side of the river in Alberta in front of that family and <laughs> booked it through the timber. There's snow on the ground. Nobody went and videotaped or took pictures of the footprints left from that being in the snow. Sometimes, who knows, I mean, when people see that those beings, it scares the living shit out of them, especially when there's kids there like there were in that video. So, uh, it's understandable that they wouldn't even have thought about running over there with the children and no weapons probably to go check out what just made possibly made footprints and let's go where it went in those thick trees said not too many people right but anyway I gotta get moving gotta get moving oh appreciate all the birthday wishes thank you so much to everybody who chimed in that was yesterday and we were traveling yesterday and doing a bunch of stuff so we're, I've got to go I gotta go inside Sarah whipped up a I asked for one of our homegrown chickens chicken dinner <laughs> for my birthday dinner which is belated today and Got chocolate cake, and I just asked her, "Do I got time to go? Do I got time to go sit and relax and share some emails?" And she's like, "Yes, you do." I go, "Okay, I'm going." But on that note, I got to go back. Share my story at howtohunt.com. That's where you get heard. That's where you share truth and knowledge. It's a good, safe place. There's other places online too, but this is a good one. Get it up your chest and share it with the people and help, and help build this trusted community of good people. Help build this community of good, honest people that aren't scared. We need that badly right now. I'll be back shortly. It didn't happen. We didn't get the sheep. <laughs> and now it's a blizzard and we don't know where the sheep went. But we saw a three-year-old ram, two ewes and a lamb. And, um, I don't know, I guess we got about... Uh, miles to go or something to get to uh, some firewood. We're almost out of food and uh, we don't have a map. 
<laughs> we don't know where we are. <laughs>